Professor Lex Paulson, among many other things, you lecture in rhetoric and political theory at the L'Institut des Etudes Politiques, uh, Sciences Po, in, in, in Paris. You have an absolutely impressive resume as an academic and as an activist in issues to do with democracy, human rights, and uh, humanitarian affairs. What has brought you to Seychelles? I am very happy to be making my first visit to Seychelles as a guest of the United States Embassy. Um, which is investing in a dialogue uh, with civil society and uh, political actors in Seychelles around issues of innovation and democracy, how we can make government more open, responsive, innovative, efficient, uh, to restore a true idea of democracy, which at its base is not about delegating power. Democracy is about giving citizens a real voice within the day-to-day -day decisions of government. And so that's been my real theme this week, and I've been very happy to meet with a whole range of actors in Seychelles society and politics, and it seems like exciting things are happening here. You have been having meetings with different groups during your time in Seychelles, and one of those groups was the media community in Seychelles. What did you talk about? What were the main things that came out of that meeting with the media? So in, with the media, um, my goal for that uh, conversation was to listen carefully to each of the uh, actors and journalists involved in the, in the media uh, uh, ecosystem in Seychelles to create what you might call a common agenda. What are the issues uh, that most need uh, to be advanced for the cause of a free and open and sustainable press. So we talked about legal and policy reforms, access to information, uh, as well as possibilities of immunity to protection uh, of journalists from revealing their sources. We talked about um, relationship building, how important it is for media and politicians to have a constructive working relationship instead of one of uh, ignoring. Uh, and we talked about the ways in which the media needs to raise its profile among the Seychellois, Seychellois, so that the Seychellois appreciate the importance of a real debate in this country, not just nightly news that shows what the president did that day, but a nightly news that is bringing issues of social concern, about drug use, about education, about the cost of living, the availability of housing, the things that Seychellois really care about that, that affect their lives. This is the role of the media and the public should uh, be a partner in bringing these stories to light. Regarding the media in Seychelles, it is interesting that during the one-party era when the media was mostly state-controlled, there were many calls for an independent media. But now that we have an opposition, in fact the opposition has the majority in Parliament, most of our newspapers are still affiliated with political parties. So in a sense they are not really independent. What is your view of this situation? Independence is a very tricky concept. I think you can have a political point of view, you can be a liberal, you can be a socialist, you can be a populist, and still remain true to a basic idea of factuality, of trying to find the facts. I think in the UK, um, there's some nice examples of this. People read The Guardian and they understand they're getting a more uh, left-wing or, or socialist-friendly perspective on the news of the day. People read The Telegraph and they're getting a more right-wing. And I don't think it means that these papers are uh, dependent or, uh, or are not serious uh, 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 journalists. I think, in fact, uh, I, think it's, I think these things have to coexist. We need to have journalists who are active in politics, who are active in the political debate, uh, and I think this is part of a healthy democracy. But they shouldn't be working for parties, they shouldn't be working for politicians, uh, but journalists, I think, are allowed to have a point of view. Professor Paulson, you had a separate meeting with members of our National Assembly, our Parliament, here in Seychelles. What, what topics were, were raised at that meeting? So we had the opportunity uh, for a full day of discussions and presentations with the, the National Assembly, not just the Assembly members, but also the Secretariat, members of the National Youth Assembly. Uh, and the discussion was one about the citizen-government relationship. How do we uh, mobilize citizens, educate them about uh, what the business of the assembly, uh, the issues that are taking up, but also how we have the second half of that conversation, how we listen actively to citizens, get their expertise, their creativity, their talents, their feedback, so that government becomes more of a two-way conversation, not a top-down command and control, but a real dialogue 
where government is learning from the expertise of citizens and citizens are informed and motivated to contribute their ideas so that government makes better decisions. Professor Paulson, you are known to be a talented writer yourself, but I'm going to quote from a, another writer, Shiva Naipaul, who, who once wrote, I was going there because the Seychelles on a Disneyland scale and in a Disneyland atmosphere had succeeded in reproducing in an astonishingly short period, 10 years, so many of the dismal features of the post-colonial world. Coup d'etat, mercenary invasion, army mutiny. In the space of a few years, the islands had lived through an accelerated cycle of political temptation and folly. Now, you have experience of, of India, as well as both Anglophone and Francophone Af Africa. What, what is your take on these dismal features of the post-colonial world? Are, are these universals that all of these countries have to go through? Well, we, we, we lived through the second half of the 20th century was a time in which many different peoples who were moving from a position of a colonized uh, uh, society to a position of an independent society grappled with the same problems. How do we uh, establish a national identity? Uh, how do we take hold of our indigenous traditions and languages uh, while also uh, making use of the modern world, of the access to quality of life and other uh, positive, uh, better health care, better roads and infrastructure. Um, but this was extremely difficult and complicated process of, of, uh, of post-colonial uh, reconstructing society. I think what's especially interesting about the Seychelles is that we're having this interview in English, uh, on pourrait facilement le faire en, en français. Oui, uh, <laughs> vous pouvez être plus facilement que moi. Um, and that you have a very interesting heritage in both the Anglo-Saxon way of thinking about politics and law and the French way of thinking about politics and law, which share some ideals of, let's say, a free press, of, of, a, of an independent court system, but the French attitude towards uh, political parties and, uh, and legislation and the balance between executive and uh, parliament is very different from the British one, which puts the parliament first, the French which puts the executive first. So I think this is a richness, finally, that Seychelles has, like Mauritius, like other countries, like Cameroon has also shared in both French and, and British uh, uh, influence. Um, I think that being able to draw on different cultures is a richness, finally. Um, but the answer will be a fully Seychellois answer. Uh, how you deal with the problem of a rule of law, how you deal with this mounting problem of drug use, which people tell me is a major issue of concern. Um, the beautiful thing about democracy is that we don't know what's going to happen. When you put power in people's hands, you can't uh, prescribe uh, the solution. It's going to be because average Seychellois people concern themselves with how we make a peaceful, prosperous, fair society for the 90,000 people in this country. I think that's a beautiful challenge to take on. Professor Paulson, looking at African countries, including those African countries that you are familiar with, uh, countries like Egypt, Uganda, Burundi, Congo, Brazzaville, Guinea, and so on, is there any hope that the ideals of democracy and justice will take root in these countries anytime soon? Look, they already are taking root in some of these countries. And I think the reason is, is because democracy is just as African as it is European or American. Democracy is a universal aspiration. People want a say in how their communities make decisions. And Nelson Mandela wrote about this in his uh, biography, that he, growing up, uh, would go to villages uh, and hear people uh, making decisions. And elders would speak, and mothers would speak, and uh, workers would speak. And so, there's a tradition in Africa in these different societies in, of people taking part and participating in the decisions that affect the community. That's not an American thing. That's not a European thing. That's a human thing. So I have great hope that societies all over the world, including Africa, will be able to experiment and improve and develop institutions that give people a voice because uh, we, have no, we have no choice. We can't go backwards. You know, we can't go back to an age of dictators and emperors and pharaohs. We can only move forward toward institutions that value people, that give people a voice, that 
uh, treat people equally and don't let people take public money and put it in their pocket. So it's a process. We're not going to solve those problems tomorrow. But in a way, I think you are more free in Seychelles than we are in America. We've had the same constitution for 200 years. You've had yours for 25 years. Uh, you have a great opportunity to uh, write the pages of history. And so that's why I'm very, I'm very hopeful. There are many reasons why the so-called migrants are leaving the, the Middle East, Africa, to go into Europe. And then we have people crossing over the border from Mexico wanting to, to go into the United States. Uh, in some uh, cases, like, like Syria, there is the violence of war, but uh, there is economic hardship as well in many of these countries. But then uh, we do have situations of political persecution, abuse of human rights, and uh, the migrants say they, they have to leave be because of these situations. D does this, in a sense, validate their leaving their countries and trying to get in into countries wh where they perceive uh, there's more democracy. I am the descendant of immigrants. My great-grandfather was born on a farm in Sweden and didn't see opportunity in his life and as an 18-year-old young man came to America. And if, you know, if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here sitting in front of you. Uh, America, my country, only exists because uh, immigrants took that same leap that people are making from Eritrea and Afghanistan and Syria to come and make a better life for themselves. So I have enormous uh, solidarity, feel enormous solidarity for the difficult decisions that those people have to make, um, including some who are smuggled. Let's not forget, America, not everyone came to America by choice. Some people were taken there in slave ships. Um, so with these problems of migration and war, um, we need to feel empathy, but we also need to understand uh, the urgency of uh, protecting the people who are crossing in these tiny boats uh, uh, who get exploited, who often are told that you know, they, they need to pay 10,000 euros and then they can then pay it back over time. So uh, just because people are coming doesn't mean they're coming in the right way. I think we should uh, protect people uh, and if possible, we should restore hope and optimism that they can live in their homes if they want to stay. Some people are naturally, they're restless, they want to go start a new life. I think that's wonderful. Some people are driven out because like in Syria, uh, there's war. Or like in Eritrea, there's political persecution. Or in Afghanistan, they're threatened by the Taliban. In that case, I think humanity, the global community, has a, an obligation to try to make life better as good neighbors to these countries and work with them in partnership to build democracies, stable institutions that respect women, that value education, that protect human rights. So I think this is a global problem and I think it's only going to become more urgent. Climate change is going to worsen the problem. We'll have more and more migrants, not less. So this is the, going to be the number one issue of the next century and we're going to have to work together. Isn't there a contradiction in the sense that we would have thought Western countries, powerful uh, industrialized countries, to want to nurture democracy in Africa, for instance, in Eritrea, for example, so that the migrants don't want to leave uh, because of human rights abuses. But on the other hand, we see situations where Western countries, as well as other powers, interfere in the affairs of developing countries. And we, we've had cases of some American governments, the idea that uh, of, of regime change uh, being used as a tool for managing international relations or defending national interests, which leaves us in, in, in Africa and elsewhere with the sense that in many ways our destiny is not in our own hands. It is uh, directed and controlled by foreign powers. I think it's a very fair question and I think the Seychellois have to judge uh, countries on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I think the American government has a lot to answer for in the bad decisions and even the criminal actions that the government has taken. But just like the president of Seychelles um, doesn't speak for all Seychellois people and his personal actions, uh, neither does the American government, should the American government represent uh, to say Shalwa, what all Americans think. I think there are many Americans who want to build positive exchanges, reciprocal exchanges, not just telling say Shalwa, uh how to act or how to vote, but entering a conversation. What can 
we share with you from our experience? What can we learn from you from your experience? I'm one of those Americans. So I hope my presence here is at least a little bit of evidence that not all Americans just come to countries to start revolutions and drop bombs. Um, but I can understand why people are skeptical, and they should be skeptical. I think judge people on their actions, uh, not just on their color of their passport. If India and China are interested in a positive exchange worth mutual benefit, I think Seychellois should be open to it and should make their judgments based on what they get in return. Uh, but if all they're getting is a lot of promises and no results, uh, then they should judge harshly and maybe reduce the influence of foreign countries. But I think there's always something to learn. Regardless of the political moment, I think we always have something to learn from each other. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Corruption in African countries and in the third world generally is one of the big obstacles to democracy and, and, and justice. And corruption is one of the topics that have uh, come up during your meetings uh, with the media and with uh, the National Assembly here in Seychelles. Corruption um, is a deeply rooted problem. And uh, there's a very important book that I, that, uh, I read recently um, called Sapiens. It's by an Israeli historian named Yuval Harari. And he talks about what makes human beings different from other animals on the planet is that we, it's not that we have language, all, uh, lots of animals communicate with each other, is that we come up with shared ideas that help us cooperate, collaborate, work together. One of those ideas is what we call the rule of law. The rule of law, which according to this idea says that everyone is equal under the law and everyone should be held accountable. If you steal money from taxpayers, you should be held accountable. But we know that that's not how the world works. We know that in Seychelles, in the US, in Russia, in most countries around the world, that corruption exists. Why? It's because some people don't believe this collective myth. Some people don't think it's so important. Some people think that if I have power, I deserve to take some of this money. Or if I want to make a deal for this airport or for this you know, harbor, um, they should pay me for this because I'm the one in charge. It comes down to a question of belief. If you, the Seychellois people, believe that public money should go to the public and the public money we should see where it's being spent and it shouldn't go in the pockets of politicians, sooner or later that will be the reality. It might take a while, you might have to throw some people in jail, but it will be the reality. But only if you believe it. If you believe that it's okay to take money from the public, it's okay to buy yourself a second house or a second car, and people just accept it, it's gonna continue. So why is this an important subject? Because yes, there are legal reforms that we can work together on. There are strategies that other countries have used. When it comes down to it, it's a question, what do you believe? There are many people who think this is how politics should happen. I mean, I've heard stories today about voters in Seychelles who are used to uh, voting for a politician that does them a favor. It says, you know, I'll give you a, a new roof on your house or I'll find a job for your... And I'll tell you, this is common to politics everywhere. You know, we're, humans are, we're primate species. We're used to doing favors for each other. You look at how politics works in groups of chimpanzees and gorillas, it's the same thing. They're taking things... So human beings are no different, right? We do favors for each other. The question is, what crosses the line? between a favor that we do as a friend, a gift that we do as a friend, and something that violates your responsibility as a public official. I think that votes should not be bought. I think that votes should be earned by politicians who have done well or who have good ideas. But only the people of this country can decide whether we're going to give our votes to people who earn them or we're going to give our votes to people who promise us a nice roof for our houses. That's up to you to decide what kind of country you want to be. Professor Lex Paulson, thank you very much. Thank you for granting us some of your time. It's a great pleasure.